Welcome. This video is going to talk about something commonly called the Vesper model, which is actually the valence shell electron pair repulsion model. And it's all about predicting molecular shapes. So why is it important to predict molecular shapes? Because molecular shapes determine most of the physical properties of a molecule, like its boiling point or its viscosity. And it also determines a number of the chemical properties one of the most important being uh, its reaction rate or its ability to react at all. So knowing a molecule's shape allows chemists to predict and change its behavior. So for example, catalysts or enzymes speed up reactions while inhibitors or preservatives slow down reactions by changing the shape of the molecule. And this is important in our day-to-day -day living and our food sources and stuff, but it really becomes important as scientists are studying different diseases. And so there's medications we make that we try and accelerate certain reactions in our body to fight off disease more quickly. But there's also sometimes where we can't find a way to kill off whatever's there, so we just try and slow it down and keep it from damaging it. That all has to do with molecular shape. So much of biochemistry revolves around molecular shape. So the VESPER model makes three assumptions. The first assumption is that all electron pairs repel each other. Okay, and that's you know the idea that you're gonna find the two electrons within a orbital maximum distance apart, and then that pair of electrons is going to be maximum distance from their neighbors. So all electron pairs are going to have the maximum distance between them. Um, lone pairs are going to take more space since there's no need to be close to another orbital for sharing. So lone pairs repel more than shared pairs. In other words, lone pairs are going to take up more space than shared pairs. And then finally, bond angles are formed by two terminal or outside atoms and the central atom, and it's these angles that determine a molecule's shape. So if we take a look at my uh, graphic down here, they've used balloons here, and now the thing I don't like about the balloons is these are actually showing the attached atoms, but you have to imagine that right here is your center atom. So if you had a center atom with just two balloons, just two pairs of electrons attached, then they would be maximum distance apart and they would form what we call a linear shape. If you had your center atom in here with just three pair attached, whether they're lone pair or bonding pair, then they would separate maximum distance and they would all be in one plane with that 120 degree angle between them or what we call trigonal planar. And then finally, if you had your center atom with four attached, and this is most common, you're going to have four pairs attached to give it a complete octet, then we would see this tetrahedral shape. So let's take a look at what's going on um, examples here. So as I said, most molecules have four pairs attached to the center atom, and these can be shared pairs or lone pairs. So to use the VESPER model, you need to figure out the shape or to use the Vesper model to figure out the shape, you need to know how many total pairs, or what I like to think of as bonding sites, are attached to the center atom. And I think of them as bonding sites because a double or triple bond only counts as one pair or one bonding site. And then when you know how many bonding sites or pairs you have on the center atom, you need to know how many are shared pairs and how many are lone pairs because remember, lone pairs are going to take up more space than the shared pairs. And so this graphic, um, you can find this a lot of places, and you'll be able to use this as you work through, although you'll probably commit it to memory fairly quickly. But you can see it gives you the name of the molecule, and you can look and see how many total pairs, and that means on the center atom. And again, instead of total pairs, I like to think of this as, oops, instead of total pairs, think of this as bonding sites. And this is on the center atom. It doesn't matter what's going on with the outside atoms or the attached atoms. And then you need to know out of those pairs, so BECL2 has two pairs, two are shared, so that means zero are lone pairs. This hybrid orbital is something we'll talk about a little bit, but basically you can just look it up. We're not going to get too stressed about it. But being able to identify the correct shape, that is what's going to be a big deal to us in this section. So hybridization 
this is the idea that S and P orbitals are totally different shapes. Remember the S is this nice spherical shape and the P is like this double peanut shape around that S orbital. So when atoms bond, the orbitals being used blend or mix. And even if it's two P orbitals that are sharing the electrons, remember how they have to bend over and form that bun shape around the hot dog shape? So we say that the orbitals blend or mix, or that's called hybridization. So it forms new identical hybrid orbitals. So if there's two bonds, then it forms two identical hybrid orbitals. If there's four bonds, then it forms four hybrid orbitals. So uh, most atoms use four orbitals because it'll have a total of four pairs that need somewhere to go. And so usually it's gonna use one, it's one S orbital and it's three P orbitals from on each atom. And so the new orbital is called sp3. And if you look, think of this as s1, p3, it's just telling you four orbitals have been combined. Multiple bonds, um, incomplete and expanded octets, they're gonna use more or less than four total pairs for bonding and shared pair. So then you get orbitals like sp, which is only using a total of two orbitals, or sp2, which uses three orbitals, or even sp3d, which is going to use five orbitals and have an expanded octet. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. CH4, four pairs all happen to be shared around the center atom. So these orbitals, these hybrid orbitals, are known as sp3 orbitals. NH3, three shared, one lone pair, still an sp3 orbital. But BF3 now only has three pair around it, so it's only an sp2. It only has three orbitals being used. And if we look at my other examples, CO2, because it forms two um, double bonds, it only needs two bonding sites. So that's just an sp, just two orbitals form. And PCL5 is going to be an sp3d to accommodate all five bonding pair. So. Here's my example. Determine the shape of CH4 and give the name of the hybrid orbital that will form. So if you remember, I just had this diagrammed on the previous page, so I'm going to cheat here a little bit, but carbon has four electrons. The four hydrogen each have one, so it's a total of eight electrons. So when I bond the four hydrogen, hydrogen is complete with just one bond. Carbon has its eight. I've used eight electrons. So this is my CH4. And now when I draw it, it's very two-dimensional. It looks like a plus sign or a cross. But its shape is actually tetrahedral. If you do it three-dimensional, it is what we call a tetrahedral shape. Or think about holding four balloons all at the ends, holding all four of them in a bunch in your hand. They would push maximum distance away from each other. So if you look on the chart on the previous slides there, I've got four bonding sites, got four sites, four are bonded pairs, zero are lone pair, and according to the chart, that is what's called a tetrahedral shape with an sp3 hybrid orbital. So here's one for you to try, NH3. This was another one that I've already diagrammed for you. So if you remember five, and then three with one each, total of eight electrons. So when you draw NH3, it's going to be nitrogen in the center. The three hydrogen are going to attach, and the one lone pair is going to end up on nitrogen. So now when you go to your chart, you've got four sites, four bonding sites attached to the nitrogen. Three are bonding pair, one's a lone pair. So according to the chart, this is going to be not trigonal planar, but trigonal pyramidal. And the reason is because when this forms, this lone pair is going to be a bigger balloon, and it's going to push or crowd these nitrogens actually closer. So if I drew this with more of a, a three-dimensional attempt to it, and I say attempt because I'm not a very good artist, but the three hydrogens are pushed down and away, and the lone pair takes up a fair amount of space up there. And since we don't see the lone pair, what we actually see is this part of the atom, the nitrogen with the three hydrogen being crowded together down below it. 
So we say it's a trigonal pyramidal shape, but it's still an sp3 orbital because four orbitals are still being used. So pause and see if you can do this one on your own. Determine the shape of SCL2. So when I draw this myself, I have sulfur with six electrons, the chlorines with uh, seven each for a total of 20 electrons. So when I draw in my lone pair, I end up with, on my center atom, I've got four sites, two bonding, and two lone. So this is something called a bent molecule with an sp3 hybrid orbital. So if I drew this more like it looks three-dimensionally, what it actually looks like is the two chlorine are crowded down on the one side, and the two lone pair are up here by each other, taking up more space with the chlorines more crowded. And then the chlorine, of course, would still have its lone pair. So this actually looks more like this. Either way is fine uh, when you diagram it, but just realize that if you're trying to visualize these molecules, this second diagram here is actually what it tends to look like. So pause and try BF3. So if I sketch it out here, BF3 just has the three attached. Um, the fluorine has its lone pair. But now boron only has three sites, three bonding pair, or three pairs attached to it. All three happen to be bonding pair with no lone pair. So now this is what's called a trigonal pyramidal because there's no lone pair taking up more space than the bonding pair. And so this is just an sp2 hybrid orbital. So pause and try CO2. So my CO2 looks like this. So I've got two sites attached to the CO or to the C, I should say, to the center atom. Remember, a double bond just counts as one bonding site because it's going to make that pi and sigma bond all in the same area, hot dog in a bond. So there's two bonds, no lone pair. So this is going to be linear. There are no lone pair to push these closer together or to bend this. So it's linear, and this is just an sp orbital. And then finally, see what you can come up with with H2O. When I look at H2O, I think of it looking like this because when I draw it, it ends up with four sites bonded to it. Two are bonds, the two hydrogens, and then there's two lone pair on the oxygen. And so these two lone pair are going to take up more space, just like we saw in our earlier example of SCL2, that's going to crowd the two hydrogen together. So this is going to be a bent molecule. And that's going to make this an sp3.